Hello, and welcome back to talking about test equipment and making measurements on Workbench Wednesdays. I have something to admit. I have heard of source measurement units or SMUs in the past, but I never actually knew what they did. They seemed like an advanced power supply or a high precision voltmeter, which those are two completely different instruments. So when the Element 14 community ran a road test with the NGU401 from Roden Schwartz, I gladly took the chance to borrow one to see what they can do. The short version is an SMU is a high performance power supply combined with an electronic load and a high precision digital voltmeter. So in this video, we're going to take a look at what kind of measurements you can make with those three things combined into a single box. Now, before I get started, please realize SMUs are not inexpensive. This one's price has a comma in it, and it's because they are specialized tools used for tasks like characterizing diodes, monitoring the power consumption of a microcontroller, and acting as a simulated battery or an IoT device. Even if you might not buy one of these for your lab, I think you're going to enjoy some of the measurements in this video. So let's go measure. Since I am using this particular unit for the video, let me show you some of the key things we need to know so that we can easily understand the measurements later on. This model has six input terminals. The force high and force low connect to the device under test. The sense terminals form a Kelvin or four wire connection so that the supply can compensate for loss across the cables. This capability is similar to the four wire resistance measurements we talked about in a previous episode. By the way, you should use very short cables for these measurements, but this is what I have available in my lab, so that's what I'm using. One thing that has always bugged me about Roden Schwartz power supplies is that their negative terminal is blue. I think the reason they use blue is to indicate that the supply is galvanically isolated. There is an additional terminal that comes with a shorting block so that you can connect those floating negatives to earth ground. The manual says this is needed for very low current measurements. Looking around the screen, there is a large area for voltage, an area for the current, and then measurement statistics, which also include power. When the display is green, it is in constant voltage mode. Red means constant current. A positive or negative current tells if it is operating as a source or sink. Next, let's get to some really fun measurements, starting with the component every project needs, an LED. LEDs are an interesting component we can characterize with a source measurement unit because they light up. I hooked up the force and sense terminals to the anode and cathode of a blue LED. I set the maximum positive current to 100 milliamps, and I am starting the voltage at zero volts. Next, I increase the voltage in 100 millivolt increments. At 2.4 volts, the LED begins to conduct, and at 2.5 volts, we can actually see it on while it conducts a few milliamps. At 3.1 volts, it draws just over 20 milliamps, which is the max rated current for this particular diode. Just as a reminder, this is why LEDs need current limiting, like with a resistor. Above 3.1 volts, the LED will draw all the supply it can give, which in this case, we limit it to 100 milliamps. So for a little bit of fun, I let this LED draw 77 milliamps for a couple of hours. Then I got bored and increased its limit to 100 milliamps and it died within minutes. See, you really do need to limit the current. One way to use an SMU is to take a component and draw an IV curve. To do that, I incremented the voltage and recorded the current into a spreadsheet. Once done, we ended up with a graph that looks like this one. And as you can see at 20 milliamps, the forward voltage is about three volts. If you think doing that graph by hand is tedious, it is. Unlike other SMUs on the market, this box does not do that measurement built in. It does have an arbitrary waveform generator and a data logging capability, which might have helped. But to really take full advantage of this unit's measurement capabilities, I should have wrote a script to make that graph. However, let's move on. Since there isn't much going on below zero volts with an LED, I decided to do the same measurement with a 5.1 volt Zener diode. That way we can see that sweet, sweet reverse breakdown action in action. Admittedly, you could have done this measurement with most power supplies. However, an SMU is more accurate as a voltage source and it has more precise voltage and ammeters. So, 
let's move to a case where you might not be able to see a behavior with an ordinary power supply. Often, I get asked how to put the ATmega 328P inside of an Arduino Uno or Nano to sleep. It comes from a desire to save power, which is a noble goal, except that a board like an Uno has multiple things on it. Let's see if there's a benefit to putting one to sleep. Starting off, here's an Uno running the humble blink example with a 500 millisecond delay. Using the graphic view on the NGU401, you can clearly see when the LED is on or off. The yellow trace is current and the white trace is power consumption. Looking at the ammeter, we can see a difference of about three milliamps. If I press and hold the reset button, the Arduino's current drops down to about 47 milliamps. Hmm. That's what some people would call a big clue. Using the Adafruit Sleep Dog Library, we can see a simple sleep example. The code puts the processor to sleep for about four seconds, and then it wakes it up for one second. I let it run for a little bit so that we could see some graph output. And there seems like there's a significant difference from on to off. But when we look at the actual numbers, that's when we see a slightly different story. While on, the draw is around 51 milliamps. But when it's asleep, the board is still drawing 30 milliamps. Why? Well, for one, there is a power LED, which you cannot control. And for two, there is another microcontroller or serial interface chip that you can't power down either. So yes, we can put the 328P to sleep, but the rest of the board is still consuming power. To really save power, we have to get the chip out of the board. Okay, with that example, we could see some of the advanced power supply and DVM capabilities. The next measurement is where the SMU really shines, but first we have to talk about the Galaxy. You might hear power supplies and SMUs get called two or four quadrant devices. If we chart four quadrants, alpha, beta, delta, gamma, uh, wait a minute, that's for Star Trek. I meant four quadrants with voltage on Y and current on X. In two quadrants, the polarity is the same, and in the other two, they are different. Sources can only produce power where the voltage and current are the same polarity, while loads consume power when they are opposing polarities. So power supplies are a two quadrant device, while SMUs are a four quadrant device, because they can be either a supply or load. Let's take a look at an example where we see this SMU transition between those quadrants without us touching anything. Well, anything on the SMU. For that, we need my bald quarter from the 500th Element 14 episode. If you didn't see that video, I built a functional tricorder like from Star Trek. The electronics are powered by a single lithium polymer cell. It is connected to an Arduino Maker Zero and a boost converter, which powers the 5 volt stuff like the LEDs and some of the sensors. The Maker Zero has a charge controller that charges the battery whenever USB is connected. For these measurements, I am connecting the SMU in place of the battery. The voltage is set for a cell's nominal 3.7 volts. When powered up, the bald quarter draws up to 70 milliamps. Covering up the proximity sensor simulates closing the flap where the usage drops down to 50 milliamps. Now, when I plug in USB, the USB connection should power the Maker Zero, charge the battery, and power the boost converter. Watch what happens. By going to negative 300 milliamps, the SMU switches from being a source to being a load, just like a real battery would. As a LiPo charges, two things happen. Its voltage goes up, and then the charge controller will reduce the amount of current that it's using. We can simulate this behavior by adjusting the voltage on the SMU. Increasing its voltage drop to 4.2 volts, we see that the charge controller has stopped shoving current into the battery. This last measurement really helps to illustrate the biggest difference between a traditional two quadrant power supply and a four quadrant source measurement unit. It is switching between being a source and a load depending on what the circuit needs. That is a huge feature when you're trying to characterize something like an IoT device's power consumption. As I said at the start, an SMU is not for everybody, but if you need to characterize semiconductors on the production floor, profile power consumption of code, or simulate batteries in an IoT device, they can be an ideal tool. If you have a question about whether an SMU is right for you, ask me over on the Element 14 community. And if I don't know the answer, we can find an expert who's a member that does. I look forward to seeing you over there or in the next video. 
For now, it is time for me to get back to precisely measuring the sourcing or sinking of current on my electronics workbench.